when we think about normal modes, essentially we're doing this. <laughs> we're listening to the bell of the Earth ring. We wait for an earthquake, or for me to start the lecture, and we listen for the frequencies of the Earth shaking. You can think of the really, really simple analogy of why normal modes are useful as this. Say you had two bells, one made of brass, one made of steel, and some awkward individual has painted them both. You can't tell them apart. You need to know which one is brass and which one is steel. You don't have a handy magnet or anything like that. If you hit both of those bells and listen to the pitch that they ring at, you can work out what they're made of. Obviously, the Earth is a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the really basic reason that we're doing what we're doing. We can get an awful lot of information about the bulk composition of the Earth from listening to the Earth's normal modes. So here's a picture of two of Earth's normal modes. The first thing I want to say is, please don't be alarmed. The Earth doesn't actually bounce up and down this much. Nonetheless, we can start to see some useful things already. So this is a picture of a mode that we normally label 0S4. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because you'll see some more information about it later. 0S4 is a particular way of the Earth shaking. It has a period of about 26 minutes. So for Greenland to bounce up and down really dramatically takes 26 minutes, or more realistically for it to jump up and down on the order of a micron takes 26 minutes. You can see, although I've said this is one mode, in these two pictures, the Earth is shaking in different ways. In this one, you could imagine that the Earth is shrugging its shoulders. Okay? So we've got, we've got the Earth rising here and rising here. That's happening at the same time. On this picture over here, we see that the Earth is kind of shrugging alternate shoulders. So these are two ways of the Earth shaking with a particular frequency, but slightly different spatial patterns on the surface. And I'm going to talk more about that and more about what that means later on. Just know that these are different ways we can think about the same way of the Earth vibrating. So the really, really basic stuff, what do I actually do if I want to look at a normal mode? What should you do if you want to look at a normal mode? What should you do if you finish tomorrow's normal modes on other planets practical and want to compare it to some real Earth data? You take a really long seismogram, and then you Fourier transform it. There's some other stuff you want to do as well. You want to clip it. You want to tidy it up. You remember that the Earth has tides, and you want to take those away. But really, you're taking a really long seismogram, maybe 40 hours, and Fourier transforming it, and looking at the peaks in frequency. So this is one of those Fourier transformed seismograms. This is taken after the Sumatra earthquake. And we see, in the frequency domain, individual spikes. And each one of these spikes corresponds to one of the notes of the Earth ringing. Each one of these individual frequencies corresponds to the frequency at which the Earth shakes in a particular way. We're going to go through all the different ways you can label these. We're going to go through a really basic case of how you could work out the normal modes for a very, very, very simple planet. And we're also going to talk about some of the complications. The eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that sometimes there are multiple spikes where there's only one label. And that's a phenomenon called normal mode splitting, and we'll get to that at the end of today. Yes, that's exactly it. In the same way that the bell resonates at one particular frequency, the Earth resonates at a bunch of frequencies. So you can think about a fundamental frequency and then the overtones, or the harmonics if you're a guitar player. When we get into the bulk of this lecture, we're going to be talking about two different sorts of normal modes, two different breeds of normal modes. And I'm really lucky that we've already had Ved's lecture, because he's already talked to you about surface waves. When Ved talked about surface waves, he talked about Rayleigh waves, which are waves made up of essentially P waves and SV waves. So the spheroidal modes are just like those sorts of surface waves. They're made up of P and SV motion. The most simple of the spheroidal modes is this chap over here. This is 0s0. And this is often called the breathing mode. So you could imagine, after an earthquake, the way this mode gets excited, 
all of the surface of the earth moves away from the center of the earth at the same time in the same way so everything expands slightly and then everything contracts slightly and then it expands slightly and contracts slightly it's like the earth is breathing that's how it got that name so all of the surface of the earth is moving in the same fashion it's moving outwards or it's moving inwards and that has a period of just over 20 minutes so compared to what you're normally thinking about when you think about these these big earthquakes and the waves they generate it's arriving after you get a wave going straight through from one side of the earth to the other and the, these oscillations have a really long period so if you want to see them really well you're going to be looking at hours and hours and hours of seismograms yes if you want, so the, there are complications due to things like source mechanisms, due to the Earth not being a perfect, you know, homogeneous sphere. But in essence, you can think about this chap as being the basic way it moves. Um, I think the breathing mode, the breathing mode after the Sumatra earthquake, I think, was about the width of human hair which sounds tiny, and somebody might correct me on that number, but it's, I think it's that sort of order of magnitude, we're talking microns, which sounds like a tiny, tiny number, why would we care? But imagine the entire surface of the planet is moving outwards that much. That's a huge amount of energy you need to pump into the Earth to do that. So the next mode we have has a name that only really works in the US. This guy, this is called the football mode. Okay. If you're in England, you look at that and say, why isn't it a rugby ball mode? What's gone wrong? But for here, this is a football mode. So you can imagine that you take your sphere and then the poles go upwards and the equator goes inwards. So we go from something spherical to this shape. And then it relaxes, but it relaxes too much and the poles come in and the equator comes out in a bulge. So you end up with something that looks a bit less like a football or like a football that somebody stood on. But this is the football mode. And this mode here is actually the one with the lowest frequency of the normal modes we, already, we normally think about. It takes nearly an hour to do this whole expansion and back down thing. Just for fun, we also have another mode. This is 0S3. Um, and you'll notice that when I've labeled these, I've got 0S0, 0S2, and 0S3. I'm going to define what those numbers mean later. but essentially you can see that they're getting a little bit more complicated the one with zero at the end is really simple this guy is two and it's doing different things at different places on the surface and this guy is 0s3 and the behavior is even more complicated it's moving in and moving out at different places on the surface so these are some really really simple spheroidal normal modes the counterpart to the spheroidals are the toroidal normal modes and you can think of those as twisting normal modes so they're more analogous to the horizontally polarized shear waves or to the love waves that Ved talked about. The first one we have up here is 0T2. And the easiest way to think about that is that somebody is trying to unscrew the Earth. So you've got the top moving in one direction and the bottom moving in the other direction. But it's OK, we don't unscrew the Earth because then it moves back again. So it's a twisting of the northern hemisphere relative to the southern hemisphere and back again. That's 0T2. The mode we have on the far right is 0t3. Again, the second number, the L number, has increased. And now we've got a more complicated twisting. The poles are twisting in the same direction. And the stuff around the equator is twisting in the opposite direction. And then after they've moved away from their equilibrium position, they'll twist back again. So it's a more complicated twisting. And finally, we have this chap in the middle this is 1t2 we finally got a 1 at the beginning of our label and the 1 at the beginning of the label tells us that not all the depths in the planet are moving in the same direction so the 1 at the beginning of the label that's an n of 1 a radial order of 1 tells us that the inside of the earth is moving in the opposite direction to the outside of the earth so you could imagine in the middle of the earth you've got one twisting motion and then the outer half of the earth is twisting in the opposite direction so Kanani. Um, these cartoons are drawn for an Earth which is all made of one thing. 
No. So toroidal modes, toroidal modes can make the inner core spin, and we call those inner core toroidal modes, but you can't transmit shear through a liquid. So these cartoons are all drawn for a completely solid, completely homogeneous earth made of blue cheese, for all I know. So we can, we can sustain those twisting motions. And in fact, where you get these opposite directions of behavior at different depths depend both on geometry and on the change in material properties through the planet. So we've got a couple of different things going on. You'll often get modes which are confined to jumps. Um, so one place where you'll get some, some different behavior confined is on the boundary between solid and liquid. That won't happen for toroidals, that'll happen for spheroidals. But I'm going to get into some of the more complicated details. These are my really, really simple cartoon pictures at the beginning. So you've had some really simple cartoon pictures, you've had some really simple analogies. I've rung a bell at you. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about how you derive some normal modes for the most simple case possible. And I know we've had a lot of equations thrown at us already, and I'm going to throw some more at you. But what I'm going to promise to anybody who doesn't like me throwing equations at you is that I will tell you when I'm done, and after the first third of the talk, there will be no more equations. Can I interrupt you right now yes. to ask? You've drawn arrows on the surface of the Earth, but what's going on in the interior? How does velocity change as you go um, in and out in radial direction? So the first thing we know is that the center of the Earth needs to stay where it is. Okay, the very middle shouldn't be going outwards because what's inside if the very middle's gone outwards? So you're going to get zero happening at the very center. For, these re for this really simple mode, everything is moving in the same direction. So you can imagine it slowly starts twisting more as you go further out because the center's stationary and the surface is moving. This guy over here, I've said something more complicated is happening because different depths are moving in different directions. And essentially, that's going to depend on what I'm going to call the eigenfunction. I'm going to show you how we get those in a bit. Ian. Could you comment on the breathing mode having a shorter period than the uh, football mode on your previous slide? I could, but I'd be making up on the spot. So who knows what answer you'd get. Okay. Somebody else might have something to say. of the breathing mode being around 20 minutes is essentially equivalent to travel time of T wave from 0 to 180 degrees with the center of the Earth. So, uh, uh, yes, as Brad said, it's compressional and 97.5% uh, is compressional. And that we have two and a half, uh, shear. Thank you. So One more. <laughs> if uh, even uh, the orbit is uh, eccentric? Uh, so the question was, how can the center of the Earth be stationary if the orbit's eccentric? And essentially, what I'm going to be talking about today is an Earth which is just sitting there on its axis. I have no moon. I have no sun. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Earth's rotation does to the normal modes later on. But we're talking, well, right now I'm talking about my fake planet made of blue cheese, but I'm going to be talking about relatively simple cases for the most part. And the biggest complications we're going to get to near the end are roti rotation and ellipticity of the Earth. And I'm not going to talk about anything like tidal effects, for example. Anything else before I plow on? Yes. <laughs> Why did I ask? <laughs> Yeah, you, you kind of commented on this, I think, with Max's question a little bit. But if, you, if the normal modes are made up from surface waves, then uh, aren't surface waves basically only trapped at the surface? Some of them can be thought of as analogous to surface waves. And some of them, you can't make that approximation. There's no, I'll point to this mode, and it looks like this surface wave. But I'm going to talk about how we make those, um, those matches between surface waves and normal modes. So I'll get there, don't worry. And one final question from Grace. Uh, 
Oh, no, Max is back again. Oh, can I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't really stop you, so. So what I was going to ask is if there's a longer um, period, or, well, longer wavelength, toroidal mode also, associated with net rotation of the surface with respect to the deep interior. So I'm not going to talk about any of the excessively long period normal modes. And I'm also not going to talk about things like length of day variation, which you could almost think about in this sort of framework. I'm just going to be talking about these sorts of normal modes. Yeah, so the, the Schlichter mode is really interesting, and one of the things that got culled from this talk, which is now half the length it used to be, was a whole set of interesting stuff about the Schlichter mode, which involves translation of the inner core, essentially, 1S1. And that's an incredibly interesting mode. It could tell us an awful lot about the properties of the core. And as far as I understand it, nobody's ever made a successful observation. People have hinted at things, but it's actually a study where people are going to use gravitometers instead of seismometers. This mode is so hard to tease out of the noise. No, and it's, it's difficult in many ways, and that's definitely one of the biggest problems. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's a quick question. I just noticed that you were missing, say, a 0S1 and a 0T1. T mode so actually pictures. what i've shown exist? what i've shown you is a bunch of cartoons okay um some of the modes are physically impossible for a, for example the normal mode which would involve just the whole earth translating sideways well yes okay and i've talked about the inner core going one way relative to the rest of the earth but some normal modes are physically not things we're going to talk about in this framework um the other normal mode you can think about is the earth just spinning round forever free rotation, which it does. We know that the Earth spins around its axis. That's the day. But it's not interesting in this framework, so we're not going to do those. But I did just show you an arbitrary selection of cartoons. And there are going to be more cartoons. So one of the tools we're going to need to do these normal mode studies are spherical harmonics. And at this point, I know some of you will start sighing and saying, what on earth are you delving into this thing that scares people for? Spherical harmonics aren't complicated. They're very often very colorful and pretty. Look, I've got you some colorful, pretty pictures. They're essentially ways of representing patterns on a sphere. Okay, So you've got a bunch of patterns on the Earth here. Um, and the thing that's cool about these ways of representing patterns on the sphere is if you use, up, if you use enough spherical harmonics, you can make up any pattern on the surface of a sphere because they're mutually independent, they're mutually exclusive. You can't make one spherical harmonic from other spherical harmonics. That's a concept we call ortho orthogonality. So what you're seeing here are some of these patterns on the surface of a sphere. And they might look a little bit familiar, because I've showed you some of those toroidal and spheroidal modes where you had things like the top of the Earth going in the opposite direction to the bottom of the Earth. So you could imagine that this stripy picture over here, where you've got red bits, the Earth could be moving in one way, and where you've got blue bits, the Earth could be moving the other way, and you could actually make up what the surface of a normal mode looked like from these spherical harmonic type pictures. So one way for you to think about what could be going on on the surface of the Earth is maybe all the reds are moving out of the surface of the Earth at the same time, and the blues are moving in, or vice versa, or maybe where you see reds the surface is twisting in one direction, and blues, the surface is twisting in the other direction. Essentially, we're just using these spherical harmonics to represent different things that could be happening to the surface of the Earth. Or, if you think about the spherical harmonics at depth, different things that could be happening to an individual packet of material at some particular depth layer. So these are the spherical harmonics. And I've plotted you the spherical harmonics for L equals 4, these are some of the spherical harmonics that actually correspond to those two dancing Earths I showed you at the beginning. You remember the one with the shoulders shrugging and their shoulders going alternating fashion? These are spherical harmonics that you can use to make up the patterns of that dancing Earth. You'd need some more as well, though. So what are normal modes and why should you care? Normal modes are whole Earth oscillations. I hope that I've got that through to you by now. Other planets and moons will also undergo these whole Earth free oscillations. 
And the oscillations of the sun were actually mentioned in one of our introductory comments by the KITP, I think it's KITP director, who's looking at those normal modes of the sun. And you're going to have a tutorial tomorrow afternoon by Philippe where you're going to look at normal modes of, I think it's the Earth, Mars, and the Moon. Is that right? So once you've heard me talk, you'll have some hands-on experience with this stuff. They're normally excited by earthquakes, and that's what we normally think about. But they can actually be excited by other stuff, like interactions between the atmosphere and the solid Earth. And that's something I'm not going to delve into today. But if you want to ask questions, I'm going to point you towards Philippe and say, ask him those questions later. And why should you care? Apart from the fact that you're sitting here and you're all very polite and you're asking interesting questions, normal modes can tell us about the gross properties of the Earth. And the real strength of the normal modes is they can tell us about density. Body waves, really, they can tell you about VP or VS. But these normal modes care deeply about density and VP and VS. So if you want to look at a body, say, in the lowermost mantle and say, is that a chemical heterogeneity or a, thermal or a thermochemical heterogeneity, and you have independent numbers for VP, VS, and density, you can do a much better job of trying to answer that question than if you just had VP and VS. So that's one of the reasons you should care. And you should care because, you know, you're all nice, polite people, and I'm standing in front of you talking. So this is a seismogram that Ved showed you. Um, it's stolen from one of the textbooks where the authors were kind enough to put all of their figures from their textbook on the internet. And what you're seeing along the horizontal axis here is time. That's measured in seconds. So we're up to 4,500 seconds over here. And Ved pointed out all the different waves you could see. We've got um, some P waves coming in, uh, diffracted P waves and PP. And then we've got our surface waves coming in. And our surface waves are coming in here somewhere on the order of 3,000 seconds. This is a seismogram from a strain seismograph in Pasadena, California. And this is a seismogram where they recorded a really big earthquake in what's now Russia in 1952. And they've actually redrafted this seismogram. They've taken it and compressed the time scale by a factor of 22. So all of the stuff you just saw on the last seismogram is happening on this seismogram over here. You can see they've labeled P, P, P. These labels are actually to do with the, the surface wave. So that's all happening in this time period. And they notice something interesting. There is some sort of wiggle going on in this seismogram. This is now 15 hours after the earthquake. And so the, the list of authors on this paper is, by the way, amazing. This is Benioff, Gutenberg, and Richter wrote this paper. And what they said was that the 57-minute oscillation, they also had a 100-minute oscillation. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. The 57-minute oscillation is a possible mode where the Earth takes on forms of a prolate and oblate ellipsoid alternately. That's 0s2. That's the football mode. This is a more sophisticated way of me describing the football mode than saying, imagine a football that squishes. Okay? It's a prolate and oblate ellipsoid altern alternately. They weren't sure what they were seeing. But this observation corresponding to this mode was thought to be something like that first observation. The, the uh, frequencies of the oscillations are very long. How long do the normal modes ring for? after a, like a, you know, something that excites them? So the, the first answer, the, the question is, how long do the normal modes keep on going for? Um, and different normal modes will decay at different rates. So some will keep on ringing faster than others. Um, and that's due to the quality factor of the mode, which we're going to talk about later. Um, the second part of the question then is, different normal modes decay at different rates. How long you can hear them for depends on how much energy you pump into them to start with. So if you put a lot of energy in, then you can keep on listening. But to give you a kind of hard number example, if I'm looking at a normal mode like, I don't know, one of the radial normal modes, I'll take 100 hours of data and Fourier transform that. Um, I think some people have made crazy long observations. I think somebody at one point tagged together months of Black Forest Observatory data and Fourier transformed that. But you want a window to look at that's short enough that the Earth is still ringing at a detectable level, but long enough to try and get as much of that signal as possible. So your, t your window length depends on which mode you're looking at and its particular qualities. Jessica, will you talk about why the y-axis is changing this time, the values? Not the axis itself, but the trace? 
you want me to talk about why there are wiggles on a seismogram? No, why on the long term it's going up. Okay. Um, Will you talk about that? So the, the question was, the question was not the simple question I thought it was. It was a good question. I'm sorry, Bill. Um, the question is why, is, why are the long-term variations on this? Why? Well, it starts, it starts about here, and you can't see because there's a, there's a football in the way. Well, it looks like it's going up, but then it looks like it's going down. One of the signals you'll see on a device like this, of course, is a tidal signal. Um, so imagine your Earth's tides. 12 hours must be about there. So one of the signals you're definitely going to be seeing this is a tidal signal. Um, and as for the other wiggles, there are definitely different sorts of frequencies going on here. This, I mean, this is a tentative observation from a strain seismometer in 1952. What you'd see on a modern day seismometer is, well, it's digital for a start. It hasn't been redrafted by some poor draftsman. Fed. Yeah, uh, people, <laughs> people say this is the first possible observation with a question mark. And it was suggested by this dream team of seismologists. Um, I'm kind of shocked that they saw it too. So I wonder, I, I wonder, and I think many other people may wonder if this is really what they saw. But it's so tempting to interpret it like that that I showed you the picture anyway. Could you explain what a, a strain seismometer is? Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I, I think not within the time constraints right now. OK, so we're going to jump into that maths that I forewarned you about. We're going to derive the most simple possible set of normal modes. So we're going to consider the normal modes of a homogeneous liquid sphere. I can't even say this is like the most simple planet possible, because even the most simple planet possible gets denser towards the middle. But this is going to be our homogeneous liquid sphere, and it's not even going to have these snazzy open office color shading effects. It's going to be completely uniform. And we're going to ignore gravity for the moment, even though gravity is important for the Earth, and one of the reasons we care about density. OK, so if there are small perturbations in the pressure, which cause the excitation of the normal modes, we can have an equation of motion which looks like this. We've had equations of motions in a few different talks now. Um, Ved talked about them. Alan talked about them. Pretty sure Michael talked about them as well. We've got density times acceleration is equal to some sort of gradient in the pressure. So that's going to be our force in this case. And we've also heard Hooke's law a few times. So the changes in pressure are going to be related by this modulus to the gradient of the displacement. So we've got Hooke's law, we've got an equation of motion. We only have to think about normal stresses in a liquid. One of the questions, I think it was a question Kanani asked, was about um, different sorts of modes in different places. And I said that you can't shear a liquid. And Ved also said that as well. That's fairly obvious when you think about it. So we only need to think about normal stresses in our liquid fake planet. So if we take our equation of motion and our Hooke's law, cram one into the other, we get something which looks like a wave equation. We've got some sort of speed squared here. We've got the second derivative of grade, uh, pressure here. And we've got the second derivative with respect to time here. And the speed I've got looks like something with a kappa over rho. So we're talking about the modulus over the density. So already, I've got something which looks kind of like a wave equation. And I'm thinking about a really simple planet. The planet is spherical. So all I've done here is take the equation I had on the previous slide, and I'm going to rewrite the spatial term in terms of spherical polar coordinates. It looks ugly, but that's just saying I don't want to be in an x, y, z system, because the Earth is round, my fake planet is round. So this is just a mathematical trick to rewrite things in terms of radius and a pair of angles. And now I want to look for answers to that wave equation that I had on the slide before. And I want to look for the easiest answers. There's no point in me looking for complicated ones. Easy ones are best. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll look for a pressure where the pressure changes as a function of radius. It changes as a function of the, other, the two spherical angles. And the pressure changes in some way as a function of time. And we've got some sort of wave as a function of time. 
but we're going to look for a separable solution. So the radius bit is different to the angular bit is different to the time bit, separable solutions. And that's the easiest way to do it. Now I'm just going to present you with a statement, and you're going to have to take it on trust. Or you could look it up in your favorite textbook. The solution to the angular bits here can just be written in terms of those spherical harmonics I've already introduced you to. You remember the rainbow stripy patterns. Those are the representations of some of the spherical harmonics. And you can solve the angular bits of the wave equation just using these spherical harmonics that I've shown you pictures of. They're just a mathematical tool to describe the variations with respect to where you are on the surface of a sphere. So we found the angular part of our equation. Now all we've got to really think about is the radial part. So what happens to this normal mode with depth? How does an individual packet of material or respond? How does it move or how does the pressure move at a particular depth? So we want to look for the radial part of this equation. And it's not a beautiful equation, but it's not very ugly. We've got dependencies on radius. We've also got creeping in here some omega squared. So that's going to be the frequency of this particular way of shaking that omega squared. And we've got these L's which have appeared. The L's were part of the spherical harmonics. And I'm going to define them properly in a couple of slides, but they can take on integer values. So L can be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3. And those L's actually correspond to the second number that I had on all my cartoons. So when I said, this is 0s2, that was actually an L of 2. So I sneakily introduced you to these angular orders without telling you what they are. So we've got our equation in terms of radius. And it depends on L and it depends on omega. And we don't want singularities in the middle of our Earth. That would be kind of awkward and embarrassing. So it turns out we can actually solve this equation using a mathematical function called a Bessel function. It's just a mathematical function. It's a way of describing a particular way of uh, displacement as a function of radius. These are our Bessel functions here. You can see that the equation for a Bessel function has an L in it. So this L was important. And our radial dependence also has an omega in it. So the omega is important. So what happens as a function of radius is also going to be important in terms of frequency and in terms of this L. So there are Bessel functions. So we've got our spherical harmonics and our Bessel functions. And that's all you're going to need to do the normal modes of this simple fake planet. Let's define some of those letters, though. N. N is the over. We have a question. If you can hang on to the next slide, you'll see it. I'm going to do this bit first. So n is the overtone number. n was in those Bessel functions. And the overtone number, the n, sometimes it's called the radial order. And you can think of this as the number of zeros you get. So if this is our displacement as a function of depth with the center of a planet here and the surface here, and the displacement slowly increases and never goes back to zero, that's got an, angular, that's got an overtone number or a radial order of zero. So when I said 0s2, it had this sort of radial dependence. The curvature will vary, but this is how it would look. As n increases, you can see n goes to 1 and 2 and 3. You get places in the Earth where there's no <coughs> displacement. That's what the angular order is telling you. Sorry, the overtone number was telling you. L is the angular order. I've already said that we've seen different Ls. And you can think of this as the number of zeros across the surface of a sphere. So this would be a mode with an angular order of 2. So it's got two lines on the surface of the sphere where you've got nothing happening. This would be a mode with an L of 3. You've got three lines on the surface of the sphere where nothing is happening. You've got no displacement in either direction. It's not going sideways. It's not going up or down for this mode. And finally, M is the azimuthal order. And that tells us about how these lines where nothing is happening are organized on the surface of the sphere. So if we've got two lines where nothing is happening, where there's no displacement, we can have them like this. So we have the stripy one. We can have the crisscross one. So 
the lines where nothing's happening are perpendicular to each other and they cross at the equator. Or you can have this one where the lines are perpendicular to each other and cross at the North Pole. This one kind of looks like a beach ball. So there, all of these letters that I've been throwing at you. I promised I'd define them, and now I have. And if we now put particular values in for these letters, so let's say for L equals 0, then the Bessel function tells us our radial dependence just looks like this. So it goes as C. That depends on our bulk modulus and density. We've got a frequency in there. We've got a 1 over R and a sine term. If we plugged L is equal to 1 into that equation, we get something which, yeah, OK, it's uglier, but it's still just signs and causes, and so on. <laughs> so I got a question about a minute ago that said, don't you still have a boundary condition? And the reason I said hold on is because I've written it finally. We still need a stress-free boundary condition. So at the surface of the Earth, at the surface of this completely liquid planet, we need to have stress-free boundary condition. So that's going to require certain things of our radial dependence. And what that does is it places restrictions on the values of the frequency. So if you need this to behave nicely at the surface of the Earth, we can only have frequencies of shaking which look like this. I have a question. So you keep calling it a liquid planet? But then why do we use Hooke's law at the beginning? It's an incompressible liquid planet. Because remember, you can still propagate a compressional wave through a liquid. You can't propagate a shear wave through a liquid, but you're OK to propagate a compressional wave through a liquid. So something, a mathematical trick, if you like, interesting has happened here. We're only allowed this planet to shake at certain frequencies. We've just found our eigenfrequencies. We found those frequencies of those bells. And I've woken up anybody who got scared off by the maths. We've got discrete frequencies that our planet can shake at. And these discrete frequencies are intrinsically tied into the behavior as a function of radius. So the frequency of that shaking is intrinsically tied into how individual packets of material are moving deep in the body and the material properties deep in this body. So that frequency can tell us what the material the bell is made of. So this is what those radial dependencies would look like. These are just me plotting up the things I had on the previous screen. And the neat thing about these radial dependencies is that they're orthogonal to each other. And that's the word I used earlier. They're mutually exclusive. You can't make up one from as many as you like of the other of these behaviors. So these are the eigenfunctions of the Earth. About your notation for omega? Yeah. Is, you have n, little n omega 0. Does that mean that that's just the frequency at the surface of the Earth, because that's r0? No, that's a great question, though, and I should have clarified that. So you remember we had our n's and our l's. Yep, and L was what was happening on the surface of the Earth, and N was what was happening with depth. So here we have N being equal to whatever you want to stick in here, and this is actually an L is equal to zero. Okay. So these are the frequencies which obey this chap, where L is equal to zero. I would have different frequencies pouring out if I tried to satisfy the boundary condition using this one, okay. and then I'd have had a 1 down there, because so L would be equal to 1. All right, so is the R0 in the numer uh, denominator... Of the that's the radius of the Earth. Okay, so it's the and maybe it would have been clearer if I'd made that RE. Yeah, that's what my confusion planet. was. Yeah, thank yeah. you. No, that's a great question, and I could have clarified that probably. Okay, so I've plotted up some radial behavior. I've told you that these are the eigenfunctions. And all I mean by that are these are the way in which the pressure changes as a function of radius, and you can't make up one from any of the others. And because we've got these eigenfunctions of pressure, we can just switch back using our first equation into our displacements if we want to. So that's it. Well, it's not everything. But normal modes. We found some normal modes. This should be very exciting for everybody. We know how our fake planet can shake. 
these aren't as complicated as Earth's normal modes. We've done a bunch of stuff to this. We've made a bunch of approximations. First of all, I haven't got any solid in my planet, so that's clearly an issue. But we found the frequencies and of these oscillations, and we've also found the way in which individual packets in the Earth move as a function of radius and as a function of where you are on the planet due to those spherical harmonics. This forms a complete orthogonal basis set. So if you add up enough of these normal modes, you can make up any way of our fake planet shaking. You have to add up a lot to make up some ways, but if you add up enough, you can always do it. The limitations are fairly obvious, but we can write any change in pressure in our sphere by a really big sum of these normal modes. So it would be nice if we did more realistic things. What we could do is have a solid planet. So we're now moving to something which is physically more realistic. So as well as just having compressional motions in our liquid, we're going to need to think about toroidal motions. We're going to need to think about twisting motions. And instead of just use, having our simple spherical harmonics, we're going to need vector spherical harmonics. So there are some equations up here. They look a little messy. They're actually really beautiful, but they just look a little messy. And all that's doing is giving you three sets of spherical harmonics which are orthogonal to each other. So some of them point in the radial direction. This one points in the radial direction. And that can tell you about motions out from the surface. And these two, this one with this, these terms here, these two vector spherical harmonics will tell you about angular motions instead. So you can just think about them all being combined to give you motion in 3D instead of in 1D. We only had the 1D case with the simple pressure before. Now we've got 3D. So, OK, they're not beautiful, but whatever. We can have a radial dependence multiplied by the first vector spherical harmonic, and another one, another radial dependence multiplied by the second, and a third rail, radial dependence multiplied by the third vector spherical harmonic. And we can now use that to write down the displacement of our much more interesting planet where we're allowed to have solid stuff. So it's a longer equation, but essentially we've got these three terms that just depend on radius, and we've got these three vector spherical harmonics that make everything into vectors that vary with angle. We could do the same for traction, so we could also think about stress, and we'd get extra equations, and then we'd probably use the elastic tensor to relate the two. I'm not going to do that. I don't think it would help the people who are struggling, and I think the people who've derived this before have already seen it. What I'm going to do instead is to say that this is something which, it's not difficult, it's, it will take you a while and a fair few sheets of paper, but we can do just what we've done before, and we can derive what's happening for the normal modes of our spherical body with the solid included. So I think your question is, so the toroidal modes should be one bit of this equation, the spheroidal modes should be the other two bits of this equation. So I flicked slides because that's what this slide is about to tell you. So I had three different vector spherical harmonics with three different radial dependencies on the previous slide in that long equation at the bottom. And if you do some rearranging, it actually turns out that one of these radial dependencies and its corresponding spherical harmonic are all you need to tell you about toroidal modes. So here we've got our twisting toroidal mode. And the question that was just asked was, should it just be that one term? And yes, it should just be that one term. So one of these vector spherical harmonics and one of these radial dependencies makes our toroidal modes. And the other two make our spheroidal modes. So this is the dancing earth with the shoulder shrugging that we had at the very beginning. So by doing that little bit of extra hidden behind the scenes maths, we've actually managed to arrive at spheroidal modes and toroidal modes. We've actually managed to explain why the Earth shakes in a twisting fashion and why it shakes in this expanding, contracting fashion. And I'm going to give you one more reminder of the terminology. 
So we've got n being the radial order. That tells us about what happens with depth, how many zeros you could get in a radial one. We've got l being the angular order, and that tells us about the pattern on the surface. And we've got m being the azimuthal order, and that tells us about how you arrange that pattern on the surface. And the point we've got to at the moment, all of the different ways of arranging that pattern have the same frequency. They're degenerate. So our spheroidal normal modes will look like this. Our toroidal normal modes will be written like this. So we've got an N and a big T for toroidal and an L. And you're going to need to remember this terminology for Philippe's tutorial tomorrow. Or you could just look at the PDF afterwards instead of remembering it. OK. We could now consider, finally, something useful. We could add gravity in. Gravity is the reason that our planets are basically round. Okay? We didn't have gravity in before. We could in add in gravity. And this is one of the reasons that normal modes really care about density. Because if you want to excite that breathing mode, that 0, S0, you want to move all the material in the Earth away from the center of the Earth. There is obviously a really big gravitational energy cost to moving everything away from the center. It's no wonder it goes back in again. There's gravity there. So we could add extra terms into our equations. We could think about little changes in displacement, little changes in density, and um, the effect that would have on the gravitational potential. And if you did that and worked through the maths, for the spheroidal mode, you'd get a set of six equations, which I have merrily cut and pasted from Aki and Richards, because they've typeset them all for me. And those equations actually, they're important. People have written sophisticated codes to calculate these. When you guys use a version of Minios in the tutorial tomorrow, it will care about things like these equations. But all we've got are a bunch of those radial dependencies for each vector spherical harmonic, which will give us the pattern at the surface. And that's just included in those equations. So when you go ahead and use a really nice code and solve them, you get this u and this v, which are how the Earth moves as a function of depth. It then gets multiplied by those vector spherical harmonics. And you can get out the corresponding frequencies. So that's it. I'm showing you now normal modes of the Earth. These are how, for these different ways of Earth shaking, you can think about the displacement as a function of depth. It then gets multiplied by some surface spherical harmonic pattern, so it's a bit different at different places on the surface of the Earth and at different places at depth in the Earth. But this is it. These are our eigenfunctions. This is what the Earth does when it shakes like that. So we've got a whole bunch of modes here. This is 0s2. We can see that for 0s2, the inner core boundary is actually just here. The core mantle boundary is just here. So we've got lots of motion in the mantle. We've got lots of motion in the outer core. And there is a tiny, tiny bit of motion in the inner core for this mode. But it's really it's hard to see unless you're close to the screen. When we let that L increase, that's the angular order. So that's, that tells us about the number of zeros that are on the surface of the Earth. We also see that what happens as a function of depth changes. And it changes in what looks like a systematic fashion. So there's lots of stuff going on the outer core. And as you move along here, there's less going on at depth. So that's an interesting trend. That's something we're going to think about. If I pick different numbers and look at the displacements there, this is now where we've got the L is always equal to 2, and I'm making the N get bigger. So that tells us about radial variations. It's always got the same sort of angular variations. Then we see that the displacements do crazy things as you change the numbers. So this mode 12S2, you've pretty much got motion going on everywhere. This mode 16S2 has a lot of displacement concentrated in the inner core. And not much is happening at the surface, not much motion at the surface. All right. Uh, yeah, you kind of lost me here. So Sorry. somehow, you, you, there's information. Like, okay, so the real normal modes maybe look like this, right? But to plot that, you have to already know something about the Earth structure in order to get the sharp core mantle boundary and inner core boundary. Yeah. So like, where That's did a great where question. did where did that sneak in? So I had that copy and pasted set of equations, and I blithely said, people have nice computer codes, and you can solve this set of equations. Do you remember that bit? OK, great. Then I didn't lose you too much. So I had that nice set of equations. The computer code solved the equations to give us our displacements. And it solved them using a particular Earth model. 
so that was that's one of the inputs. so when you play with mini-os tomorrow you'll input an earth model or you'll input a mars model or you'll input a moon model and you'll get different patterns depending on what you've thrown in there senses like the, the is prem okay all right cool. and so it's got velocities and densities and as we're going to care about later it's also got attenuation okay so we've got modes which care about different bits of the earth they can care about the mantle some of them can really just care about the crust. Some of them care about the core. And we had those lateral variations of the modes. And I'm going to show you those cartoons again, because I've been showing you the depth functions, the functions of radius. But we have, remember, different patterns on the surface of the Earth. So for our toroidal or twisting mode, this is a way that 0, T2 can twist. So that's the, I said that was the unscrewing of the Earth and the screwing the lid back on. We can also have twisting, which works in a different direction. So you could imagine material moving yeah. sideways and then back in again. So the front of the Earth looks like a pair of electric doors, that sort of thing. Um, if we move to 0, T0, zero, we can again rearrange the different ways of twisting in different ways. And the same is true of those spheroidal modes. So as a quick recap of the figures I showed you before, these are some of the figures I showed you before, where this is 0S0. Zero and this is one way of distributing those lines where nothing happens on the surface. This is another, and this is a third. And that's how that 0s2 mode, the football mode, looks. And 0s3, you could do the same thing for. So these are pictures of how 0s something looks. At n is equal to 0, so we've got no places along the depth of the Earth where not much is happening. And we can plot those up, because I remember we said each mode had a corresponding frequency. So these are the corresponding frequencies of the modes where n is equal to 0 and l is increasing. You can see the frequency increases steadily when you increase the angular order. So that's interesting. Something about how many zeros there are on the surface corresponds smoothly with the frequency. It's not that interesting, but it's kind of interesting. And these are the displacements corresponding to a bunch of those zero modes. So this is 0s2, the football mode. We've seen that a lot. Then we go to 12 and 22 and 32 and 42. And 52 and 62 and 72 and 82 and 92. And when you move along this branch, all the things with n equal to 0 and l getting bigger, you can see that the displacements get more and more concentrated towards the surface of the Earth. And this is something that I think it was Joshua asked about, standing waves and surface waves. So these are the modes which look like surface waves. Okay? You can imagine if you've got all your shaking concentrated in a small band at the surface of the Earth, that sounds an awful lot like the surface waves which Ved introduced and defined. And this is one of the places where you can think of normal modes as analogous to surface waves. Here's how the cartoon version goes. You have an earthquake. If you propagate your Rayleigh waves around the Earth and leave the Earth going for a while, eventually you'll get those waves constructively and destructively interfering on the far side of the Earth. It's like water waves in a pond in this case. And that can set up a standing wave. So those surface waves are constructively and destructively interfered to set up a standing wave, which is actually completely analogous to one of those normal modes. In this case, we're showing you a plot of 0s25. And there's a simple way you can write down of how a surface wave will move with a horizontal phase velocity if it's equivalent to a normal mode with a particular frequency and a particular value for L. And that's the radius of the Earth here. So this is where that analogy comes in. Some of these fundamental surface waves, where that, sorry, fundamental normal modes, where that n is equal to 0, can be considered to be directly analogous to the surface waves. And that means they can tell us about the same sorts of things. Okay. Yes. Yes, it's looking at exactly the same thing standing in two different places. It's exactly the same physical shaking that's happening in the earth. It should be that uh, there is a phase shift uh, at the pole source and its antipodes. Yeah. So this is why we get this L plus one half. Yes.
So that's our fundamental branch. That's the n equals 0 branch. And we can draw on our plot the next branch up. So I've changed the previous red line uh, to black. We've got the next branch up. We can see... <coughs> Excuse me. We can see interesting behavior as we increase our angular order when n is equal to 1. And then we can add all of the other modes. We can keep on adding up modes. And you can see these are our, this is our fundamental branch. This is what we've already shown. These are our Rayleigh-like waves. But we can classify some of the other sorts of modes as being things like PKIKP-like. PKIKP was one of the phases that Ved mentioned. It's one of our alphabet super seismic phases. The P is a P wave in the mantle. The K is a compressional wave in the outer core. The I is a compressional wave in the inner core, and then back out. So PKIKP is a body wave that samples through the entire depth range of the Earth. And the PKIKP-like modes are modes which care about structure at all of those different depths in the Earth. They're normal modes, they're not body waves, but they care about the same parts of the Earth. And you can see that we've got ones which are like PKIKP. We've got ones which are like SKS, so they care more about shear in the mantle, and P a bit in the outer core. And we can classify modes like that if we want. We've missed out an interesting branch of the spheroidal modes. These are the radial normal modes. And they always have that L, that angular order equal to zero. And that means what's happening on the surface of the Earth is the same everywhere. We've got none of those angular variations. It's the same everywhere on the surface of the Earth. So they have smoothly increasing frequencies. And the radial modes are really useful because they keep on shaking for a very long time. So somebody asked how long you keep on watching for. And if you want to look at these radial normal modes, which tell you about the really big scale average structure of the Earth, you use 100 hours of data. These are the ones you want to use those long data windows for. The toroidal twisting modes, you can do all the same things. You can play all the same tricks. So these are the toroidal twisting modes. You can see for the fundamental branch, as you increase the angular order, they care more and more about stuff close to the surface. And this is a plot of those modes. Oh, where's our label? And those fundamental modes for the toroidals are love-like. So they're like our other sort of surface waves. They're like the love waves. When Ved explained the love waves, he told you that they cared about horizontal shear velocity. So you can see that the twisting normal modes should be analogous to things which care about horizontal shear velocity. When you look at modes which have very low angular order, you'll get modes which instead care more about things like shear velocity in the mantle. So we've made our whole zoo of normal modes. We've got all these different sorts of normal modes which shake the Earth in different discrete fashions, different ways. The normal modes are orthogonal to each other, so you can't make up one way of shaking from the other ways of shaking. And they each have a discrete frequency which depends on the material property of the Earth. We've only got one thing about these normal modes that we've failed to define so far. If there's no attenuation in the Earth and you have an earthquake and it starts shaking... We quite like it to stop shaking. That, that would be kind of helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce attenuation. Each of these modes after an earthquake, the ringing dies away. When I hit that bell, I'm not going to do it anymore, don't worry. When I hit that bell, it stopped ringing. So each of these modes will keep on shaking for a particular length of time. And what we have for each individual mode is this Q. The Q is a quality factor. It tells you how good the mode is at keeping on shaking. So if you've got a mode with a high Q, it keeps on shaking and shaking and shaking. You can listen for ages and still hear it. If you had, have a mode with a low Q, it gets attenuated very quickly. So it's there and then it's gone. Even if you manage to get some energy into that mode, and how much energy you can put into each mode depends on the earthquake, depends on the source details, then for a mode with a low quality factor, It'll start oscillating and then it'll give up because the Earth is too attenuating. So that's it. We've defined all the important characteristics of our normal modes. This is a plot of some observations of normal modes. It's pretty old now. It's 1996. Much more beautiful plots have now been made. The blue circles, we can see observations of some normal modes. And the red dots, we can see what Prem would predict. For the most part, they're pretty close. In fact, there are a bunch of them where you can barely see both dots because they're overlapping. But in some places, Prem is not perfect. 
So in some places, you'll see that the quality factor, how long the mode keeps ringing, isn't quite perfect. If you could zoom in a little more, you'd see there are tiny, tiny changes in the frequency of each of these oscillations. And Prem does a really good job for many of them. But obviously, other stuff is going on with the Earth, like you know, it's spinning round, for example. Earth's rotation is going to affect some of these normal modes. Another thing that will affect Earth's normal modes is the 3D lateral velocity structure, because at the moment, my Earth is 1D. But with pictures like this, I think you can now make sense of what I've got as a first observation with no question mark. In the 1960s, we had a sequence of very large earthquakes, and they provided some of the really unequivocal proof that we could really see Earth's normal modes. So this is a comparison of uh, spectra taken after two different earthquakes, one in Chile in uh, 1960 and one in Alaska a couple of years later. And even on this old data, we can see beautiful spikes. What you're seeing here are the fundamentals labeled, so 0s2, 0s3, 0s4. And with the dotted lines, you're seeing things like the toroidal modes. You'll notice you don't really see the toroidal modes. This is because this is a vertical component. This is 7,854 minutes of data Fourier transform. That's a really nice round number. Um, what that really is is five and a half days of data that they've used for strain records to get these sorts of images. But even in the 1960s, people were able to start making observations. And we can compare and contrast that, really, to what we saw after Sumatra, where we saw these really, really crisp normal modes. So normal modes can do cool, useful stuff, and they can tell us about the gross structure of the Earth. And I have stolen here a table from a paper that Adam wrote a few years ago now, where he used normal modes to prove, essentially, that the inner core was solid. There are a few different ways you can try and prove the inner core was solid, but this is a particularly compelling one for me. Tables aren't the best thing to show in a talk. But what you can see in front of you is a bunch of modes, the periods that they're observed at, or the frequencies that are, they're observed at, period is 1 over frequency, and how well a solid inner core fits these modes. So this is a solid inner core. This is relative error. And for the nine modes, the solid inner core gives you a relative error of 0.12. If you'd made that inner core liquid, for the same nine modes and the same model but with a liquid inner core, you get a relative error 10 times as big. So the normal modes are incredibly powerful about telling you things about gross structure of the Earth, the really big patterns. And in fact, it doesn't really depend which your favorite bit of the Earth is. So here's a picture of Prem. Here are some of the things you might care about. You might care about the inner core with solid iron. You might care about the liquid outer core and what's going on there. You might care about the lowermost mantle. You can look at special sorts of normal modes called Stonely modes. And if you play enough mathematical tricks, you can get the Stonely modes to tell you about the structure right at the bottom of the mantle and top of the outer core. So if you care about post perovskite this is the place for you. I've put up here Bridgmanite. I had trouble spelling it because it's such a new word for me, but I think it's probably OK now. We can find out about the growth structure in the mantle. We can look at the upper mantle as well. I haven't bothered labeling any crustal phases because my picture's only so big. But whatever your favorite bit of the Earth is, normal modes can help you out. So now I get to the complexities. Because we still have a relatively simple Earth. And we can add in some complicating details. What we've looked at is what they call the Sneary Earth, or the Sneary Earth. It's not a particularly attractive name, but what it means is that the Earth is spherical, it's not elliptical. So we know that the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, it's squished at the poles. This is a non-rotating Earth model we've used. That's obviously not right. This is an elastic model we've used. Although we've considered that the modes are going to die away in frequency, we haven't actually stuck that into the equations. I've just told you it's going to happen. And this is an isotropic Earth, and even Prem has some anisotropy in the 1D Prem model. So clearly that bit's not quite right. And this was a great thing to do to start with, our Sneary Earth. That's definitely the right way to go about doing this. But I said that we had modes which the individual M numbers, the different ways of arranging the zeros on the surface of the Earth, I said they all had the same frequency. 
all of those things, doesn't matter how you arrange your zeros on the surface of the Earth, they all had the same frequency. If you had no motion in that stripy fashion, that had the same frequency as no motion in, for instance, the crisscross fashion. That stops being true when you consider an Earth which is elliptical, rotating, attenuating, and anisotropic. Things which previously had exactly the same frequency now get moved a tiny bit apart in frequency. And when I say a tiny bit apart, I mean a tiny bit apart. So this, again, this is 0s3 up there. 0s3 has a frequency of about 0.47 millihertz. And all of those different ways of surface arrangements now have slightly varying frequencies, but everything is less than 0.01 millihertz away, millihertz away from the original. So we've got tiny separations of the, these different ways of shaking, which are caused by heterogeneous structure in the Earth, by the fact that we have a preferred direction in the Earth because we have a rotational axis and ellipticity, by the fact that we have anisotropy in the Earth, which is different in different places. So this is splitting. And it seems like a complication at first, but actually this is the stuff that tells us about the interesting bits of the Earth. It tells us about the lateral heterogeneity. It tells us that our large low shear velocity provinces are different to the rest of our lower mantle. This is the stuff where some of the real power comes in. You don't often see lots of these individual spikes. So this is still one normal mode, and we're seeing individual spikes for the different M numbers, the different azimuthal orders. But what you normally see instead is you see a big blurry peak. And your big blurry peak is made up of those individual spikes which are really close together and they form a big blurry peak. So this is a really nice observation. It's kind of confusing the first time you look at it, but it's what those big blurry peaks look at a lot of different stations in the Earth for one normal mode. And these have been ordered according to the latitude of the stations. So we've got high latitude stations at the top, and you can see that the peak shape and width and position is ever so slightly different at the top to in the center. And down here, we've got these really nice kind of sharp peaks compared to this, these double peaky blurry messes at the top. So we've got different of these M numbers being seen at different places in the Earth. So different places in the Earth will see singlets which care about structure at different places in the Earth. And these singlets are those individual M numbers. So one mode is made up of a bunch of singlets. In your perfect scenario, Earth, they all have exactly the same frequency. And in your real Earth, they're ever so slightly apart. If you can see really well, you can see they're two different frequencies, but often you'll just see a blurry bump. So this is 0s2. Yes, 0s2. This is that football mode. I've kept on using this one mode as an example because it's a nice mode in many ways. And you can see the individual spikes. This is station, uh, this is Canberra, I think. So we're looking at a recording from Australia. And we can see we should have these five spikes here. For something where L is equal to 2, the angular order is equal to 2, you're going to have five possible M values. You always have 2L plus 1 possible M values. I don't think that's an important thing for you to know, but that's why there are five things. And we see a really strong signal for this end value, a really strong signal for this end value, weaker ones for this one and this one, and we don't see a spike at all for this middle end value. When we look at a different station, this is, uh, I can't say it, but it's Hyderabad, something like that. It's in India. Um, this is a different station, different geographical location. And again, we see the outermost peaks are really big. We see a little peak for these guys, and we see a relatively prominent peak in the center. So at different places on the surface of the Earth, we're seeing different ones of these singlets uh, more strongly and less strongly observed. So we can tease out information about lateral variations in the Earth, about anisotropy, um, about the effect of ellipticity and rotation. And this is actually due to rotation. And I know I promised you no more maths, but yeah, there's more maths. Just one slide. Um, for rotation in the Earth, the splitting by rotation is given by a relatively simple equation for the toroidal normal modes. So we used to have just one frequency that all the singlets shook at. For the different M numbers now, you have slightly different frequencies. You'll, affect, you'll have this change in the frequency of those different singlets, and it depends on your M and on your L, and then just on Earth's rotation. So this is the frequency of Earth's rotation. 
So the fact that Earth is spinning around at a particular rate causes splitting of normal modes. And you can have a slightly more messy term for the spheroidal modes. Of the spheroidal modes, rotation affects 1s1 and 0s2 most strongly, and all the details, all the maths are going to be in your favourite textbook. All of this maths for the normal modes was derived over a sequence of papers in the 70s and 80s, and they are beautiful papers. They are really crisp and really clear. Some of them have a couple of typos, so check for any amendments. Um, but th these are really simple ways of working out why we're seeing these different singlets. And I like this next map a lot because now we're seeing, again, those singlets for 0s2 at a bunch of different places on the surface of the Earth. I was talking to somebody about this guy last night. This is a station really close to the South Pole, station DRV. The South Pole, you can't quite see in that projection, but we're right down here, the edge of the Antarctic. And the way the geometry works, if you're standing at the South Pole, you can only ever see one of those singlets. The spherical harmonics, the pictures that I had right at the beginning with the rainbow colours, tell us that if you can look at the South Pole, you will get pure information about just the m equals zero singlet. Unfortunately, it's relatively hard to do seismology at the South Pole. But the way the Earth's geometry works means we can look at these special places, we can look for particular values, and we can mathematically predict which singlets we hope to be excited by a given earthquake. Seismologists will often show you pictures called splitting functions. Because it's nice for me to show you a spectra where you see a bunch of spikes, and that's fine. And then I can show you a map with spectra, and you can see a bunch of spikes. But that's for one earthquake and a few stations. What we actually really want to know is how does one normal mode over many earthquakes care about the structure of the whole Earth? So we use splitting functions. And the way you need to think about this to get a gut feel is not really to look at the mathematics. The mathematics is there. It's the underpinning of all of this. But the splitting is made up of some different terms. It's made up of terms due to rotation and ellipticity. I had an equation for one of those. There's another equation for ellipticity. The splitting, or how far apart these modes move from each other, is also affected by 3D elastic structure and 3D anelastic structure. The anelastic variations are apart from very rare occasions, mostly ignored, the 3D attenuation. It is possible to try and look at this. Barbara is one of the people who's thought about it. It's incredibly difficult. So for the most part, people draw a big red X through that and say, another day, another year. So there are equations for how a, what a splitting function is. But essentially, a splitting function tells you about how the depth average structure under one point on the surface of the Earth is seen by a normal mode. So it tells you information about the messing around in frequency of those different singlets, what that does to what you would expect to see right here where you're standing. So it's depth average. All the structure under a point in the surface of the Earth is integrated to give you what, that's, what the splitting is at that one place. And then you do that for a whole range of places all over the surface of the Earth, and you make a map. You make a pretty coloured picture which tells you about how that mode sees structure integrated right through the Earth. That's what a splitting function is. So the equations say that you've got kernels, which are basically which bits of the, the Earth that mode cares about. You've got parameters which tell you about why the Earth doesn't look like our 1D sneery Earth. And then you integrate over the entire depth of the Earth, that's what the integral is, to say this splitting function is telling you about how we see the depth integrated picture of the Earth for this one mode at this particular point on the surface of the Earth. And then the map is all the points on the surface of the Earth. So that's going to make much more sense if I show you an example. This is 0s4. 0s4 was the mode at the very beginning, the, you know, the Earth shrugging its shoulders and had a jumping from side to side mode. And the reason that there were two pictures there is that's because those were two of the different singlets that make up 0s4. So the Earth was shrugging its shoulders or tilting a bit from twisting one shoulder and then the other shoulder. And those were two of the different singlets, two of the different ways that 0s4 can shake the Earth. That's two different m numbers, two different azimuthal orders. And there would have been a whole bunch more, but I didn't want to crowd that first slide. If you make a splitting function for 0s4, and this is a splitting function taken from Gabby Lasky's website, you see 
the effect result is we've got yellow colours here under the Central Pacific. We've got yellow colours here under Africa. And we've got blue colours and the Circum Pacific ring. That's how you describe this map in terms of colours. The coefficients of the splitting functions actually tell you about how that mode is affected. And we see that we've got completely opposite things that this mode sees under the Central Pacific and that this mode sees under cent Central Africa. If we look at the displacements for 0s4, this is just from pl Prem plotted up here. This is where the core mantle boundary is. This is where the inner core boundary is. We see that 0s4 significantly cares about stuff in the lower mantle. So what's stuff in the lower mantle? What pattern is this seeing? Yeah, that's exactly right. This splitting function is saying that this mode here, which cares about the lower mantle, is seeing something under the Central Pacific and something under Africa, which is opposite to the rest of the Earth. And we know this mode cares about the lower mantle. This splitting function is a map saying that what this mode sees reminds us of tomographic maps of the lower mantle. Fed. Are you going to give the uh, caveat that even if there was only one super plume, it would see both because it's only sensitive to even ordered structures? I can if you like. Well, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Like no, I, I, I'll do that and I'm going to talk about how you could see odd degree structure as oh, well. Okay, so, great, great, great. Um, so, the first thing, let me say this first and then you have your question. And um, with a mic, please. The first thing that I want to say is this is not a tomography image. Okay? This is not a picture of VP or VS or density. This is a splitting function, and although it reminds us of tomographic images, it's really, really not one. It just tells us about the sort of variations that a normal mode sees due to structure. So I don't want anybody to think, and then Jessica showed me a tomographic image because she did everything. No, not even slightly. This is a splitting function. Okay? And it reminds us of a tomographic image because the Earth looks like the Earth, and the mode is seeing the Earth we look at with tomography. But this is an observation made from data to tell us <laughs> what that mode sees. Now I can do a question. Uh, what you just said was um, when you look at a map like this, the, the splitting function is telling you something about the depth average structure right beneath that point. But that ac actually only holds for high Ls, right? The local eigenfrequency approximation. Um, so when you're looking at a map like this, when, you, uh, when, you, when you're pointing at a particular location, it's not only sampling right below that point, but also laterally averaging. Yeah, and the other thing, so th there are two things I'd like to mention here, and the first one will answer your question, and the second part will hopefully satisfy that. When we make these splitting functions, these are actually built of spherical harmonics. So all those stripy pictures, we use those mathematical functions to build these guys. So this is made of a limited number of spherical harmonics added up. So it's only ever going to be able to see a big blurry structure. And because 0s4, it's got an L number of 4, so it only sees fairly big chunks of the Earth at once. If you imagine the mode is seeing a chunk of the Earth, and then it's got a zero line, and then it sees another chunk of the Earth. They're really big chunks. So it's got very limited resolution. So it can only see big structure. And the normal modes are going to be good for telling us about gross structure. If you want to image, I don't know, some small blob, some 25-kilometer heterogeneity somewhere in the Earth, you're not going to see it with normal modes. For that, you're going to look with high-frequency body waves. These are going to tell us about large degree structure, not the titchy stuff. And then what Ved was hoping I would talk about is that as well as us building these splitting functions with spherical harmonics, the spherical harmonics and Earth's geometry, the geometry of a sphere, tells us that individual normal modes can only look at even degree structure. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about all of those things and about the coffin. Don't worry, don't worry. They can only see even degree structure. What do I mean by even degree structure? Well, we heard Max say odd degree structure in his talk yesterday. An odd degree structure was where one half of the Earth was opposite, had an opposite quality to the other half of the Earth. That's an odd degree structure. But the rules of spherical harmonics and the geometry of the Earth says that normal modes can only see even degree structure if you look with first order approximations at individual normal modes. 
So what VED was concerned about is that if you had a structure where you just had one superplume, well, that's a lopsided odd degree structure. So if we filtered that through an only seeing even degree structure lens, we could well see a picture that looks like this. Happily, we have all the other sorts of seismology to help us out of those geometric binds of only being able to see odd degree structure. I can't resist making a comment. Go for it. I think you can think about it that uh, the modes are, are made up of surface waves that travel around the equator. Yeah. And then the Yeah, that's an awesome way of thinking about that. And that really works well with those fundamental modes. It's true at depth as well, but it works really nicely with that fundamental mode analogy. So I'm going to wrap up, and I maybe will even finish on time. I've, I said that the odd degree structure could only really be seen by these, these um, normal modes if you allow them to interact with each other. So an individual normal mode only sees the even degree structure. And I said that these normal modes were mutually exclusive. They're independent of each other. You can't make up one from a bunch of the others. That was the orthogonality I talked about. Unfortunately, the Earth is really quite messy and complicated. And it turns out that when we calculate our normal modes, which are true for prem, where they're orthogonal over prem, where they're mutually independent for prem, they actually can kind of overlap ever so slightly for the real Earth. So it turns out that modes can couple or interact. That means that they're not completely independent. And I was trying to think of a good way to, to explain this. And some people helped me at dinner last night. So I'm going to give this a whirl. And if it makes no sense, then I'll just move on. But you can imagine if you're trying to get across the screen somehow. You're starting here, and you want to end up in the O of mode. If we define a Cartesian system, then you can go so far along this way and then so far up, and you have got to where you want to go. Okay? So we've got two directions which are completely independent of each other, and you can get to the place where you want to go by adding up a certain amount of direction one and a certain amount of direction two. And that's because the screen is nice and flat and well behaved. But say the screen wasn't actually as neat as we thought it was. And say this end of the screen is lifted up by a few feet. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to break the screen. But imagine that the screen is now a little bit tilted, a little bit skew if. When you travel along what you thought was a straight line at the bottom, you're actually traveling in this direction. Our two directions of travel are no longer completely independent. And one of them overlaps a little bit with the behavior of the other. They're no longer orthogonal. And that's what's happening with the normal modes. When they couple, it's because the Earth is a little bit more complicated than being a really flat screen. It's got these tilts and twists and complications. And the normal modes are no longer completely orthogonal to each other. And that means that energy can either move from one to the other or, to think about the same thing a different way, the real normal modes are actually mostly this original normal mode and a little bit of this other guy added in. The normal modes couple or interact. And they couple or interact due to ellipticity, due to rotation, due to lateral structure in the Earth, also due to anisotropy. And that's one of the things I hope to talk about when I talk about the inner core. What does that mean in terms of the picture I've got here? Well, this is a picture from a lovely paper by Guy Masters who looked at coupling between spheroidal modes and toroidal modes. And what he found was if you ran the calculations of the frequencies and the quality factors of these modes, and then did it again and took into account the possible interactions between the modes, you got changes in the mode frequency and attenuation. So I'm going to draw some circles because it's a black and white picture. And it's kind of blurry. So on the left over here, we've got crosses down here and up here. And those indicate the frequency and 1,000 over the quality factor, so the inverse quality factor, of a pair of normal modes. That's what the crosses are for. And you're seeing two panels, because this one has mantle structure as well. When you calculate the coupling and add that in, the frequencies 
and the quality factors of the normal modes change. So now the frequencies are all smeared out, the quality factors are all dragged out. These two modes have interacted and their frequencies and their quality factors have changed. Because in this case of Earth's ellipticity and rotation and attenuation, and for this one as well, they're even messier because they've also got lateral structure in the Earth. So we're seeing changes in the frequencies of the individual singlets. This is just two modes, so we're seeing lots of symbols because they're individual singlets. Seeing changes in the frequency and in the quality factor, so how long those singlets take to decay because of normal mode coupling. And that has some interesting side effects. So this is an observation of a normal mode, and it's a vertical component of the normal mode. But we see peaks in the observation at 0t2. 0t2 is a twisting normal mode. There is no way that that should make the surface move up and down, because it's twisting. It's not moving up and down. The surface is twisting. It's staying at the same height. But on this normal mode spectra, there's a peak at where we expect 0t2 to be. And that's because the toroidal mode has coupled to nearby spheroidal modes, and we're now able to see the mode on the vertical component, because what we're really seeing is a hybrid, which is mostly like the old toroidal mode, but enough like a spheroidal mode that we can see it on the vertical component. You can take this one step further, and you can couple whole suites of modes. And what you're seeing on the left here is 140 normal modes coupled together, so they're all allowed to interact if they want. You're seeing full coupling, those 140 modes coupled together in black, and the dashed line is some data. And they agree mostly, and they disagree a bit. Picture on the right is full coupling, it's a solid line again, and the dashed line is self-coupling. And you can see that in some rare cases, and this is one of those cases, the difference between taking into account the fact that the modes could interact due to Earth's structure and not taking it into account can sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, be as big as the difference between our synthetics and the data anyway. So in some cases, you really have to care about this. And the last slide I have is one where I've coupled together modes which care about the inner core with different sorts of anisotropy in the inner core, different models. And you can see that we've got differences between the solid shapes where there's no coupling and the open shapes where there's coupling allowed. And those differences, not only is there a difference between self-coupling and full coupling, there are also differences between what sort of structure you put in the Earth. That changes what sort of coupling's allowed. And these couplings remove some of the geometric rules and would let us see the odd degree structure. So the simple case is that we have self-coupling and that works most of the time. But occasionally, for special places in the inner core, I would nearly always argue is a special place, there are particular models and methods which mean we need to think about coupling of normal modes. So in many ways, this is even better, because this can tell us about the even more complicated structure of the Earth. We've gone from Adam's paper of 1971, where you could use normal modes to infer something huge, like the inner core is solid to more recent observations where we've tried to look for structure at the core mantle boundary and structure in the inner core using these complicated mathematical tricks of coupling. So we're seeing really interesting, relatively complicated structures, as well as being able to use that power to see things like, hey, the inner cores are solid. So I've thrown an awful lot of information at you. Um, I was luckier than VED. VED had to do all of seismology apart from normal modes, and I just got normal modes. But I hope that that's given you a feel for them. I hope that's given you an idea of what the important parts are and what the strengths are. And I'd love to answer as many questions as you want now. If you have a long question, maybe grab me in person at any point during the next three weeks. And this is my first cider as an instructor. I came in 2010 as a participant. And I'm so pleased to be here and be able to talk to you all. So thank you very much. In a practical sense, you said that normal modes could tell you a lot about density, right? Yeah. So what can it give you numbers? Can it give you relative values in the Earth? Can And is this 10% density deficit in the outer core that I've been quoting from a 1952 paper still correct? <laughs> um, so normal modes are the best way to look at gross density structure in the Earth. Um, that 10%-ish still holds up. 
Um, normal modes are a, a good way to look at that. I don't know of anybody. So I had a CIDA project in 2010 with Sana and Mark Panning, another few people who are here, another few people who aren't. And we actually, one of the things we did in our CIDA project was to look try and look with the normal modes at that density deficit. And we found results in that case that were fairly equivocal. We found enough results to have an AGU poster, but not really enough results to publish it properly. Um, that was three weeks' work. I think that's a really interesting project, and it's actually something I'm working on at the moment. But learning about density is one of the real strengths of the normal modes, and being able to distinguish between density and shear velocity anomaly, for example, as opposed to having to do what you do with body waves and say, Assuming this bit of mineral physics, I can map from this velocity anomaly to this density anomaly. That's risky if you're not quite sure what your chemical structure is. So normal modes are the best way to do that. And people have published on that, and that's an interesting thing to do. Um, and I would always argue that if you want to know density, normal modes are much better than body waves. This is a sign that everybody needs coffee. Thank you.